I want to say hi to everybody. Uh, my name is Gregory Luce. I'm on the board of Adoptees United, um, and I'm really excited for tonight's program. Uh, we also have our other board members, most of them here. So if you see Erica Bavino, Annette O'Connell, Chelsea Wright, Anthony Walsh, Aubrey Jackson, or Shauna Hodgson, um, I, I always want to uh, give a special welcome to our other board members. I also want to th say thank you to those who, um, when you signed up, you um, contributed some funds towards this program. Uh, those funds are very important to all the work that we do and will go to supporting um, our events in the future. And I imagine we'll um, have a more formal fundraiser in the next few months and one possibly on this very specific issue. Um, for those who don't know what we do, we're a national nonprofit tax exempt organization. Um, we are, we, um, our contributions to Adoptees United are tax deductible. Um, we're an educational and advocacy organization, and um, we put on events like this, but also uh, have a deep commitment to um, diversity, inclusion, and belonging in uh, adoptee in the adoptee community. And um, that's one of our major focuses right now. And I'll talk a little bit about our next event on that. Um, as you can see, this is our board. I mentioned their names um, just a minute ago. And uh, so, and you can also see and read more about our board members at our about page. Upcoming events include the next one is um, about a week from a little more than a week from now. And I encourage everyone to sign up for this one. It should be um, really interesting and really engaging. It's who do we mean by we, the voices of adoptees. Um, we can put um, in the chat a link to sign up for that, but you'll also, if you um, signed up for this uh, program, you'll get an email um, either tomorrow or the next day on how to sign up for that. And uh, that will be um, a conversation with some of our board members as well as some other guests about um, about you know how they identify and um, and their space within the adoptee community. November is Adoptee Aware Rights Awareness. We'll have some programs throughout the month. On November 9th, they'll have an overview of state and federal legislation. Uh, November 28th is another um, diversity, inclusion, and belonging um, event on but the history of adoption, the good, the bad, and the traumatic. It gets into some eugenics issues and other issues um, related to race and ethnicity and even religion. Um, uh, December 9th, I think it'll be a very popular program. It's something I hear about a lot. It's undoing uh, your own adoption and whether there should be a right to annul or discharge uh, your adoption when you are an adult. Uh, in January, we'll have some political messaging, and also we're working with Marley Greiner to do a session on the Safe Haven Baby Boxes and Overview. So that's our programming coming up um, over the next several months, and we'll probably have other uh, events filling in. If you've gotten, if you signed up for this, you'll get emails for um, the other events. Tonight is about um, controlling the adoptee context and narrative, and that's using Wikipedia as the target in some ways of where narrative about adoptees, adoptees come from. I should mention this is being recorded. Uh, so those who are uncomfortable with um, having their image on the screen should, uh, you can feel free to just um, turn off your video. And we will have time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, this will be a, a very brief, it could be long, but I expect it will be brief introduction and overview. We don't have all the pieces in place for this project. It's a long-term project that I think will finally uh, be launched formally in November of 2022 during Adoption or Adoptee Rights Awareness Month. But we'll have some smaller events along the way as well as organizing um, this project over the course of the next year. So when you look at Wikipedia, there are some problematic issues, uh, depending upon who you are. I should say, too, that before I start, that this project has been done by other communities in, in across the globe. And this very specific project that we're going to launch is inspired by a, a group called Art Plus Feminism. And I think we'll put a link into that into the chat room. Um, and that their focus was to 
change, not so much change the narrative, but change who reports that narrative and, and bringing in more voices of women art, artists and uh, women art historians and women historians, and also changing problematic entries that have um, been sustained by Wikipedia's encyclopedia and editors, which are predominantly, in that context, white men. But in Wikipedia, if you start to look at it, and I encourage you to start um, searching Wikipedia on adoption-related entries and read through them carefully to see what you find. And you'll find that there's often no entry. So there's no entry for adoptees or adopted people. We can get to whether there should be or, or not and how hard it is to, um, to do that. There's no entry on the Adoptee Citizenship Act. There is one on the Child Citizenship Act, which is the one that essentially led to the loophole in the current law. And so that's something that we would examine over the course of the next few months. What entries should be in Wikipedia that aren't? And how do we get them in there if we decide that's something that really should be in the, world, the world's biggest online encyclopedia? The other kind of... Um, perspective are looking at problematic entries and whether it's transracial adoption or adoption in general or intercountry adoption many of those are not written by adoptees many of those are not written from an adoptee perspective um, they certainly exhibit bias you come across that quite a bit or they're simply out of um, date or incorrect and I've done some editing in Wikipedia I know how it's done I'm not an, certainly not an expert but those those edits have made a difference in how this issue and how our issues and our narrative is um, communicated to the world. And especially if you think about it, students who are often searching on an issue to find out what is, you know, what's adoptee rights or what's adoption all about. And then reporting that back to their, their other fellow students or to the teacher or to other people. So let's look at some examples that of what I call a problem problematic entries. And sometimes it's that they're glaring, and sometimes um, it's interesting when you come across these, and what kind of perspective is being uh, sold to us in Wikipedia. And I'm not saying people are bad; it's their perspective is not does not take into account adoptees or maybe an actual biased perception. So, for instance, opposition to interracial adoption has been reactive to extreme misuse. And so the, the example of extreme misuse sort of downplays that there's, that it's not really a problem. And so I think that deserves a more closer look. What do they mean by extreme misuse? What are really is, is their opposition to interracial adoption? What does that look like? It doesn't always relate to what they think of as extreme misuse. The other thing I thought was interesting is that, um, and I have to move this real quick is that if you all know your history a little bit, in the 1970s, the National Association of Black Social Workers came out in opposition to transracial adoption. They felt it was, um, and it says it here, cultural suicide. But what was fascinating to me is that this downplaying of who that, whoops, let me go back, who that group was, and it says which consisted of 12 members. So completely um, eliminating by that little comment the any power that the National Association of Black Social Workers had. So why was that inserted? And why are they trying to undermine that finding in the 1970s? So that's something that we would look at. We would determine if that's something that needs to be changed uh, or edited out. And we would work on um, gathering examples like that to do that, to do so. Um, this is from international adoption. This is another uh, missing context issue. Um, so they talk about in the United States, citizenship is automatically granted to all foreign born children when at least one adoptive parent is a U.S. citizen in accordance with the Child Citizenship Act of 2000. Well, <laughs> the missing context there is not certainly not all. And adult uh, adoptees today, and, and, and in fact, many uh, children still do not receive automatic citizenship under the Child Citizenship Act of 2000. That's why we may need, and I think we should, have an entry in Wikipedia on the Adoptee Citizenship Act, even though it hasn't passed, 
um, because it has been introduced and has been in Congress for the last five years. So that's a con that's an example of a missing context that really should go um, into Wikipedia to educate those who are searching on this issue and learning about it uh, through the encyclopedia, but not getting the full story. Here's an entry on the National Florence Crittenden mission. Um, this has a really limited history. If anyone who was, um, and I'm sure there are uh, some of you on the event tonight that their mothers were in one of the Crittenden homes. So it was a chain of, of uh, maternity homes across the country. But the entry for the National Florence Crittenden mission, which ran those homes, is really limited. And um, it doesn't have much of the history of what was done to the women in those homes and the coercive, coercive practices that existed in those homes. And there's plenty of published um, information about Crittenden and how it operated. So that's something where you have a limited history in Wikipedia that really needs to draw out the context to get a full story. So limited context, another example of limited context Part of the limited context about when you talk about the number of adoptions, um, no one really knows, in the U.S. at least, how many adoptions occurred between generally the years 1975 and 1999, uh, 2000. It just we don't they they weren't tracked, and that's still not tracked well today. So this gives the idea that there are two million adopted children in the US. Well, it might be true that there are minors that are, if you talk about minor adoptees, there are 2,058,000, but there's really probably five to 6 million adopted people. And there's some context that I think needs to be uh, included in this entry because you're always adopted, generally, unless you talk, we talk about undoing your adoption, which we'll talk about in December. But we need to take, we're not always children. And that's one of the narratives we're always fighting is that we are perpetual children. And so when you talk about adoption in this context, we're counting only children as adopted as opposed to the, the vast number of uh, adult adopted people that exist in the, in the United States. So that's something, another example. I just, these are just quick examples. Once you start looking at many of the entries on Wikipedia, you will find a lot of these missing contexts, uh, problematic content, uh, limited information, or just bias or outright incorrect information. So that's what this project will do initially is have a team of, I hope a lot of people going through Wikipedia, finding these entries, noting what they say, potentially having an opinion on what they may want to be, how they may be, need to be corrected and working through that database that we all gather to choose which ones we're going to essentially change or provide more context or even edit and eliminate biased content. And that's sort of the first step of this whole project is identifying where there are issues. Another first step obviously is organizing. How do we organize this large project to get as many people involved as possible? Um, because we're going to need a lot of people to do this. That's one reason why it's going to be um, a lengthy process because we can't do this quickly and it's going to need a lot of people to help us do it. So just so you know, for those who, and there may be people on the event tonight that have edited Wikipedia, may have found it frustrating or may enjoy it. Um, but there are three things that are the sort of the core of Wikipedia that you really need to know before you sort of jump into this, because it may not be your cup of tea. Um, I say in jest, we can't just make shit up, nor we can throw it at the wall to see if it sticks, but <clears throat> that's true. And these are the three you have to be, there has to be neutrality. There has to be a verifiability. And I say publish, but what, the real core um, value of Wikipedia is you can't provide any original research. So you can't put a, your research in to Wikipedia. There always has to be 
and it goes hand in hand with verifiability, there has to be something where um, there's a reliable source for that information. So for neutrality, um, this is from the Wikipedia essay that discusses these um, issues. Articles must not take sides, but should explore, explain the sides fairly and without editorial bias. So normally as an advocate, I'm not neutral. And, but as a, a lawyer, I'm very skilled at being neutral, but also ferreting out the facts that really make our case. And in some ways, neutrality is such a loaded word. I don't know if anyone can genuinely be neutral, but you can present an argument neutrally. Um, and so that will be the challenge is to get our perspective and voice across without sounding as if we are biased or if we are biased at all. So that's neutrality. Whoops. Uh, it has to be verifiable or verifiability. Um, it's just not made up, basically. There's a source that you can cite to. It's reliable published sources, and we can get into more detail about um, what sources are good and what may not uh, work for Wikipedia. And um, they often, often look as a standard, is there any material that is going to be challenged or likely to be challenged? And so you're going to have to have citations to that um, material. Typically, in, uh, it can be secondary sources like a newspaper, uh, it could be a website, uh, as long as it's a reliable source. And then what I call published, but they call no original research, research. It must be attributable to a reliable published source. This, I mean, as a, someone who has edited entries before, um, and I did it mostly around the issue of original birth certificates, so, and it was a case of missing context, incorrect context, or incorrect information, it was not hard to uh, be neutral, have verifiability, and obviously it wasn't any. I wasn't including any original research. I was citing back to um, other uh, reliable sources. Um, unfortunately, because you know some of those sources adopt your rights law center, I couldn't readily attribute back to them. You have to have. Essentially, you have to be conf you can't have a conflict of interest. Um, that's where we come in as a larger group, where there may be someone on the team who does not have a conflict of interest, but does believe that there is um, a good source, and that's as a reliable source. I mean, it could be American Adoption Congress, it could be uh, Concerned United Birth Parents. Those are reliable sources, and they may have articles that relate to a specific topic or issue. So that is why it's good to have a large group of us together working on this. The other thing that you have to realize, and this isn't one of their core values, but it is something that's really important, is that it has to be a notable topic. Basically, we love you, but it, you may not be notable yet. So it has to have sufficiently significant attention by the world at large. Uh, I can't, I mean, there's plenty of examples where you think something should be on um, Wikipedia, but it's not. Adoptee rights, the term adoptee rights may be a good example. I mean, we all live that, many of us do, but is it notable? And I think our argument is going to be, how do we make it so in, in support that it is a notable uh, topic? And we, we very likely have the reliable sources behind it as well. So just because, you, you know, we're very interested in a very specific topic, it may not meet the notability requirement to be listed or added to, to Wikipedia. But that's something we can discuss along the way and have, I hope, a list of uh, topics that we think should be added to Wikipedia because they are important, they are notable, and they are, do affect a, a great number of people. And there's lack, information lacking on Wikipedia about that topic. Um, I want to talk about the rough, this is a rough timeline. I say rough because um, uh, this is a project that will be defined in many ways by those who participate in it. So as it goes along, we're going to probably run into issues and, and we always run into um, hard problems that we're going to have to solve. 
so this rough timeline is considered if everything goes well, this is where we should be along the way over the next year. Uh, what is ongoing along that whole time frame is um, we're going to identify entries on Wikipedia where the corrections, additions, or more, more context is needed. And we're going to figure out the database that allows you to report those and so that we can collect them and have them and hopefully share them with um, everyone who's interested. Um, we're going to need written resources. Um, the target is by, by uh, mid-January of 2022 of printed and online resources that can give you an idea of what you, how to um, essentially be an, whoops, uh, be an editor and contribute to Wikipedia. And because it's not so much finding the information and writing um, and editing, there's a lot of sort of little technical issues about how you cite things. And so that's part of the training is to, how do you, how do you put something in the citation form that Wikipedia uses? Um, we hope by February to organize teams in locations if that's what works, or it could be around affinity groups, it could be intercountry adoptees, it could be intercountry adoptees in a specific country because I, I do see this as a global project, not just one that involves the United States. Um, so hopefully we can have um, small teams developed by uh, February, 2022. By March, it would be nice to do some mini sessions, basically taking a few topics, looking at them carefully and figuring out, okay, let's jump in and see if we can make the changes that we believe need to be made in that entry or if, if we're gonna add an entry, whether we can add them. And so what, what I mean by if we can, typically overseeing many of the entries in Wikipedia is an editor. And that editor is always looking out for conflicts of interest, um, notability, making sure there are citations to reliable sources. And so if you don't meet one of those, the editor's gonna, uh, it may ding you. It may not allow that entry to be edited and they'll just revert back to where it was. So I don't see that happening very often. I think if we have an organized um, project, but that's why I think we need to start sort of putting our toes in the water in March and seeing where we go from there. And that's what happens in April. Again, this is a very rough timeline. We're gonna see where, where we are, who is participating. If we, you know, our commitment is to diverse inclusive uh, group. So we need to make sure that uh, that's what we have. It's not just one, uh, general group, and my concern is whether we have primarily white domestic U.S. adoptees that are participating, we need to reach out, include um, a much broader cross-section of, of the adoptee community. Um, hone skills over the summer will continue with the sort of the mini sessions. We, you know, we continue, uh, the ongoing part is to continue identifying where there are issues and what we need to do. And the big launch would be in November of 2022, which in the United States, people know as Adoption Awareness Month, we're trying to take that back and have adoptee rights awareness, but we could have multiple edit-a-thon sessions during the month, including one large 24-hour session on November 15th, the middle of the month on November 15th. And why I say at 24 hours that if we do this as a global project, and I'll introduce Linnell Long here in a minute, I forgot to introduce her at the beginning, sorry, Linnell. Um, uh, Linnell is in Australia and this, her uh, organization, Intercountry Adoptive Voices is very interested in being part of this project and I'm very happy to have her. But that 24 hour session would include those who are in 16, 17 hours away from much of the United States. Um, my hope is I'll be up all 24 hours, it'd be kind of fun. And then in December, assess how the whole project went and whether to continue, and if so, what recommended changes we have. That's the project in a nutshell. Um, and I hope that makes sense to people. And I hope it interests you because I think when we all talk about how the narrative controls adoptees, this is one, I'm not pretending it's gonna be earth shattering or, or change the narrative um, substantially, but it is one way we can work to change the narrative. It's something that I can say when someone asks me, what can I do? 
I say you can jump in and, and, and take control of your own narrative as adoptees. And this is one of those instances where I think it would be uh, not only um, fun, it should be, um, but also power, it would be empowering. And so I'll open it up to questions and answers there, but I do want to introduce Linnell. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, Linnell Long, she's an intercountry adoptee from, who was born in Vietnam, but adapted to um, adoptive parents in Australia and has been involved in this space for many, many years. Uh, I really respect her work, her commitment, and I was thrilled when I reached out to her and, and told her about the project that she thought it was a good idea and um, is all in. And so, I don't, Linnell, if you could just wave to people so they know who you are or say something, just say hello. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this. Um, you know, my organization is, is global. So that's why I think it's really great if we can especially bring in some of our European adoptee rights activists. Um, you know, they've, they've been doing this work for many, many decades. Um, and it's so important that we take control of the narrative. And I think this is just a fantastic way to, to really, you know, yeah, take positive steps for ourselves. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Anel. Appreciate it. Um, are there any questions, thoughts? Um, and I'll check the chat as well. I think I need to bring it up here. Oops. Um, I will say that we have a, a, it's not really a sign up form, but I, I will immediately after this um, session, I'll send out an email that allow, will allow you to say, yes, I'm still interested. These are the things I would love to do. And so that we have you down as someone who would jump in and be available once we start to get the resources going and um, are able to begin the whole the begin the project uh, likely in January, February. So I'm looking at the chat now. Any questions, uh, Annette, you think we should? Um, well, Laura commented that she appreciates how well thought out the project is and that with the right amount of structure for something so big and new, and she wants to echo the importance of having authors with non-dominant identities. Yeah, that's really, that's super important. I mean, that's part of, and you know, and I can't sell this, um, our next event more is that this next event, which is about adoptee voices are very much about that. Um, and it's very much about what Adoptees United um, is committed to. And so not only is it going to be important, but it's going to be critical and it has to be built into the project that we assess that all along the way that we're with that. It's not a non -dom it's not a dominant identity and a dominant narrative um, that is being um, added to Wikipedia. And Erin says that she noticed at the top of the talk tab on the adoption entry that the article is part of the Adoption, Fostering, Orphan Care, and Displacement Wiki project. And a frequent editor is user named Baston. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, are these people we need to coordinate with? Do we know who they are and how they're related to adoption, if at all? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I don't see a lot of real names on Wikipedia. I'm probably for good reasons. I don't know the reasons why. Um, it could be someone who's connected to adoption. It very likely is. I don't know how many people that are involved in editing the adoption related entries are actually from uh, the adoption industry itself, which has a very vested interest in making sure that it portrays the, you know, sort of a positive adoption uh, outcome or outlook. And so it could be that we would get to know some of these editors that are on these pages and on these entries that they, we could learn more about them. We may not. But again, if you stick to the three core values of Wikipedia, neutrality, verifiability, and um, no original research, you're, you should be fine. Um, although there is an art to, you know, staying neutral um, when in fact it's no one's really neutral. 
You, you can't, you can't, there's no objectivity in information. There really is not. Just wondering, Greg, um, have we thought about engaging adoptees who are also academics? Because uh, they often have, you know, this skill set for for the research that's needed for verifiable documents and articles, and they have that whole skill set. And I know that in ICAV we have a huge number of adoptee academics, um, which you know I'd love to get involved where and where it fits. So it'd be good to identify, I guess, the particular skill sets. Um, that we really want to target and harness to to bring in. That's a great, great point. I mean, I know quite a few academics in, in the United States as well, and um, I would love to have them, if not as consultants, as someone who may actually contribute. Or um, I've had people who have offered bibliographies from their writing, which would be extremely useful when you're trying to look for a reliable source. And here you have adoptee academics that have uh, written about, you know, adoption and have a long footnoted, essentially bibliography with their sources, um, or we could source their studies. So yeah, I think I think you're right, and I think the idea of a skill set is perfect because that's really what's <laughs> going to take. It's those people that are skilled in certain areas. It could be in developing the resources, or in your in the case of academics. Um, thinking through a subject and all its nuances as well as having the information available. Yeah, that's a great answers, point. That answers one of the questions that was brought up in chat as well. So that's great. Um, someone else, Beth asks, she's interested in the portrayal of adopted people in popular TV shows and movies. And is that something that you think could be included on a wiki page? Yeah, I think that's a great question because, you know, people look at these Wikipedia pages for these shows, fictional books and TV shows and movies. And um, if you can, if you can talk about it neutrally, the, uh, you know, the characters that's adopted and how it's portrayed and how it may be different from how adoptees experience um, life. You know, the, the issue there is going to be, where do you get that reliable source to counteract any kind of, um, mischaracterization of adoptees in a portrayal. I, I did, you know, not to bring up a controversy that's currently in the, <laughs> in the um, adoptee space right now, but the, the movie Blue by You, if you look at the adoption related entries currently, there are all these entries for Blue by You, the movie, because someone somewhere thought it would be a good, good idea to add that to Wikipedia. And um, people see it as a way to promote the movie possibly, or people want to bring out the controversy around it. Um, but to me, it looked like there was someone behind it to say, make sure that blue Bayou came up and searches on adoption, which it does. Uh, because, you know, when you search for adoptees on Wikipedia, you don't, it, it says that that entry doesn't exist or it's, um, it, uh, you get redirected to adoption. And when, but it'll pick up all the other entries that do mention adoptees, and one of which was Blue Bayou. And Dale suggested, which is a good suggestion in my opinion, it's a good idea to find out who the frequent editors are for a particular page. Often, discussion on the talk tab is how edits get agreed on. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of filters into Phil says, How would you deal with topics that the adoptee community doesn't have consensus on? What? There's topics that the adoptee <laughs> community doesn't have consensus <laughs> on? Oh my God. Well, I mean, and it the is, question it is, is, would you share all viewpoints? <laughs> it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I, you know, take something that's near and dear to my heart that is uh, original birth certificates for domestic US adoptees. And my position that there should be an unrestricted right to request and obtain it. That's not, I think the majority of, of adoptees believe that, but not um, a super majority. And I, I do fear that as you put that in there, that's going to be weakened by adoptees that are going to add um, the issue of, you know, well, we should compromise on that right and allow birth parents to redact it. Again, I think, you know, if you can't control that in Wikipedia, if someone wants to edit it and it's, backed up by reliable sources um, and it's, there's no conflict of interest, then I think that's going to be added 
I think we do have to talk earlier than later about how to handle those kind of issues where there is no consensus within the adoptee community itself. And so that's a great question and something we're going to have to work out. Um, Anthony, just so that you know, Gabrielle is a good friend to Adoptees United. Anthony put that he's going to read American Baby. Another that's fantastic. <laughs> I, I that. So I'm, uh, yeah, no, this is exciting. And, uh, you know, we'll be reading and gathering non-original sources to, to do for the Wicketon. Good. And, right. and Laura asks, will there be a role for recruiting authors to ensure that the right folks are involved and to cultivate the community of writers across the life of the project? And she adds that community building is a beautiful byproduct of this project. Thank you. So hey, Laura, you, you mean writers specifically, those who have written and or, or published, I assume. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Again, that kind of goes into the whole bibliography as well. Um, where, I, and I've seen this on Twitter or on Facebook, where adoptees are creating bibliographies of adoptees who have written and published books or poetry or, or, uh, or nonfiction. And I would love to get that. I would love as a side project, as you talk about developing our own large sort of almost wiki, but more in the form of a bibliography that we can share with the public if they're interested in various issues and they come to Adoptees United or come to ICAV, which is Linnell's group, and they want to know who, who can we talk to. I think ICAV actually has this, actually. Um, who can we talk to about these specific issues? Um, and we'd have a list of a bibliography or, or a list of people who are knowledgeable on this specific issue. So yeah, Laura, that's a great, um, that's a great question. I think that we would love to have writers involved in that. Yeah, I, to, I, oh, go ahead. Just to clarify, by authors, I meant the people who are writing the entries in Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. Acknowledge that you know there's the default, which is going to be dominant identities, and unless right. you make conscious effort, right, deliberately to bring in others. So the idea of having someone who's doing that a kind of outreach. That well, that's I mean that's a core of what we do. Yeah, so it will be included, definitely. Yeah. And it's going to be built into the assessment of how we're doing as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to look up in six months and find that we have a small group of people who don't represent the adoptee community doing the work. Yeah. And that outreach is really from all of us. Right. Everybody. Yeah. Did those would know that Erica is uh, the, a board member of Adoptees United, but she's also leading the effort of diversity, inclusion, and belonging for Adoptees United as well. And she'll be essentially leading the discussion in 10 days or a week, about a week from now on Adoptive Voices. So I encourage people to sign up for that. Uh, you'll get an email about signing up for that in the next day or two. Greg, you're gonna like this one. Okay. I might switch, but you're gonna like it. Is there a way to also allow people to contribute in an, a, in an asynchronous ways, thinking that a Google Doc or Dropbox folder would be helpful for each entry? Yeah, I think that's that's how I ima imagine we would do this, is that we would have a database that's sort of living, and as people, um, whether it's a Google Sheet or a Google Doc, or uh, that's something we had to figure out. Um, these things become kind of like a Wikipedia entry itself, in that we've got multiple people looking at this and discussing it and adding it and, and, and essentially saying, yes, we should add this, or no, we shouldn't. Uh, you know, so it will be asynchronous, definitely, along the way with, um, it, but, and, you know, asynchronous means as well, we'll have meetings like this as well, because these are going to be important so that we can see each other's faces and talk through these issues that we can't resolve on a spreadsheet. But yeah, that's going to be very important to have that kind of database that's living and being added to and being discussed. And the reason why I said I was going to twitch is because I have PTSD from Google Docs from New York. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sorry you guys. Know, <laughs> I, you know, I want to find a platform. I, I want to find a platform that's easy to communicate that's not Facebook. And you know, every time I mention Slack, which I kind of like Slack, uh, it gets it gets it gets panned. So I don't know. It's some the 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 technical part of this is something that. You know, I'm going to start building right away or, or, or looking for people to help me build it. Peter, there was, comment. There was, a, there was a comment I saw back um, about someone who, I think it's Mary, who's a technical writer. Yes, of course. If you're a technical writer, 
um that would fit in really well actually oh yeah i'm sorry i said i didn't may, might not have addressed her name or her skill but i said when we were talking about steps. Oh, okay yep. so sorry mary um so you know i scrolled back where was i uh asynchronous ways rebirth certificates from peter um to access you could reference other countries legislation not just the usa i.e australia yeah i think the current Wikipedia entry talks of makes a difference between the countries as well. Yeah. And Eve says about a resource bibliography. I hope that's a byproduct of what we do. A large one, actually. Because I have a ton. I have a huge bibliography right now, and I'm willing to share that um, to anyone. Greg, I was just going to ask too. Um... I think it's important we develop a process or, or some some agreed way in which, you know, if there's disagreements or strife that happens, because, you know, whenever you try and do these amazing, you know, projects with a great vision mission where we're trying to change, you know, the, the current status to get to a better utopia, um, things will always go astray because adoption is so personal to every person. Right. Um, and I think, you know, it's, pertinent to kind of have a risk strategy for how do you how to manage conflict that comes up amongst adoptees within this project you know what's going to be there as a safeguard to I guess mediate make sure that people don't get toxic um, you know what are the boundaries what are the rules for how people operate in this project so that's something in my experience, I've done multiple projects that are big, large, you know, dealing with adoptees and, and this stuff is also very personal. And I always, when I talk to government, when they fund stuff like this, um, I always talk about the fact that you've got to have a, the emotional support uh, um, usually is probably the first critical thing to make sure that adoptees have a space where you know, if they get triggered or they get upset or they get into um, a fight with another adoptee on the project, that, that there is a space for them to actually deal with that. So I think it would be, you know, it's, I'm just sharing this from my own experience because I know how quickly projects can get out of hand and damage and toxicity can just run amok and completely off rail the whole project. So I hope that, you know, the, this group or whatever forms can work also on making sure that you know you have scaffolding around to protect people. Yeah, that's a safe. that's a great point. I mean, I I I said at the beginning this project was inspired for me. It was inspired by what the group called Art Plus Feminism has done over the years. A very multicultural um, uh, organization, but they also have built in what you know, the spaces and how these spaces are going to work for people and what's tolerated, what's not tolerated. I don't know if they have a dispute resolution component, but it's something I'll, I, I know some of the people that are involved in that organization and I'll reach out and find out what they did to lessen that um, issue because it will become, an, I guarantee you it will be an issue. I mean, we see that anyone involved in advocacy for adoptee rights knows how uh, messy and at times toxic and it can become. And this certainly should not be a project that uh, allows that to happen, or hopefully it's not a project that would have that at all. But we do, I think you're right. I think we have to plan for it and make sure it's there, that, that what you call scaffolding is there before we essentially launch into it. Because you can't, you, can't, you can't retrofit it once, it's, once it started, yeah. I love that scaffolding comparison. It's a great one. Um, Marley says it's been a long time sh since she's edited wiki postings. Is there any mechanism to inform those of us who edit to know if changes are being made to our work or the page that we are working on? And then down below someone, and I'll tell you who it is, and Aaron mentions your favorite thing, Slack. Greg, the yeah, yeah I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll keep looking at Slack, but Marley, um, there should be a way on Wikipedia to be notified if, um, changes are made to a particular page. I, I do want to shout out to Bastard Nation. Marley's the chair of that, but Bastard Nation has a long entry on Wikipedia and like way to go. I don't know how you did it, but you did. 
but you've been around for a long time and that's probably why you were notable are notable but yeah i think uh there is a mechanism in wikipedia that you'll be notified if there are changes um doris would love to develop a large bibliography for us and for wiki mindy has something that was in the new yorker um and a professor at sanford is cited several times he would be a valuable resource Dale used to be a wiki contributor ages ago there's a history of edits for each page and he doesn't know whether there is notification mechanism slack slack i'm gonna scroll right past it <laughs> people, people have said they want my slack too and chris People, no, people have asked if they want they want my bibliography, and I, I was like, now I'm embarrassed because I don't have it in a format that I can share easily. But it will be that, that's something I will work on and have it done by the end of the year. Yeah. Stick in the Discord idea. Media Wiki. This is from Shane. As a collaboration and documentation platform brought to you by a vibrant community, photo participants of the Wikimedia Hackathon 2019. Oh, this. So I think that Eve just uh, volunteered, I don't want to say she volunteered, maybe she did, but to dispute resolution, resolution professional. Okay. Um, yeah, I think as we build that scaffolding that Lynn talks about, we will reach out to people who have skills in, in dispute resolution and, and um, you know, resolving uh, issues between people. Um, so that would be built in. Yeah. So that will be you'll notice on the form we send out tomorrow or maybe it's tonight we list things that you may be interested in there's an other you can select and and write down in there if there if we don't capture you know sort of this small list of sk skills or things you're interested in just mark it in that comment of the other what you can offer Eve is a dispute resolution professional, mediator, collaborative attorney, happy to contribute any skills in that context. That's awesome. Thanks. Did I skip any? I really appreciate all the questions. This has been... They've been great. Yeah, and this is also how I envision this working. It would be a large collaborative project um, likely broken down into various smaller groups depending upon how we would do the actual work but the idea would be this is a shared resource just like wiki a shared resource that everyone could take part in developing but also can share in what we create and uh, i really appreciate all the um comments that we're getting and even the, the very good questions because i'm sure there will be things that arise that we haven't thought we certainly haven't thought of now and um that we need to get a hold of before we get any further in you know deeper into the project is there anyone whose question or comment i skipped because legitimately i am going blind so sometimes i like see triple and sometimes i see nothing no but the other thing too is you know erica mentioned this laura it was an issue with laura um but in a very um good point is that we need to reach out um to communities that um so so we have a broad participation by multiple adoptee communities and so if you know of others um please make them aware of this project how welcome they are for the project um and so that we can develop a, a larger group of people who can contribute Just a question, because I'm thinking globally. Um, does does Wikipedia get translated into all these different languages, or is it just English? It's English. It's a lot of languages. Yeah. So whatever but, you put in, um, if someone say from the Netherlands is reading it in Dutch, does it just automatically convert? Or oh something? no does no. It... So they they have separate wikis for for a number of languages. Uh, so there's an Italian oh, I... wiki. There's a there's probably a Dutch wiki. Wikipedia. I, I can so then, actually give a more complete answer to that. Oh, cool. Um, That'd be great. Greg, you are completely correct. Um, there is some effort to actually have people 
manually as human translators translate articles that are broadly useful across multiple languages um, for things that are specific to, for example, English speaking countries, they might not translate the pages and it's, it's all done um, by individual uh, volunteers. It's not done automatically. And if so we have anybody who can act as a translator, uh, that'll get it. Well, so my question languages. would would be, you know, for the a lot of the adoptees who work in adoptee rights that I deal with, you know, um, in Europe particularly, they all would be very interested, I think, to have it in their native language, not just English. So um, I guess we'd be wondering what your scope is. Is this project just going to be just the English version of wiki and then others can kind of go off on a tangent and decide if they're going to leverage what's been done in English wiki and convert it or are you going to in this project facilitate that those European adoptees who might also be interested that part of the scope of the project is to include the other language wikis so that's a great question I think we're it's it would be beyond my our scope to do a uh, various languages but the we could certainly would i would love to have their involvement because it's not an it's not a hard to replicate model um and so you know the very basics of wikipedia apply whether it's in dutch or italian or um, any language that you know has to be um neutral verifiable and can't be original research and you know it has to be a notable topic but so those and how we all do it and organize could be replicated in other uh, language wikipedias but with that said i mean it would be very valuable to um have the conversations going back and forth between groups that are working in let's say dutch and those who are working in english and those who are working in spanish um you know because one of the it's this is an organizing function too if we're going to organize a global movement around adoptee rights, this is a prime project that could help do that. And so you can't close the door on, I can't, what I can say is that we're not going to close the door and make it only English. It's got to be broader. It's just the, it's a resource issue more than anything. Yeah. Uh, Sharon would like to know, is there going to be a harm minimization umbrella or an abolitionist umbrella? Well, hold on, let me see. I, I, I would need that explained a little bit more so I can understand the context. Um, I suppose just the overarching principles that would be used um, because that could lead to different um, different uh, things that are written in so if if you're looking at oh well um, we're going to talk about um, that 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 there are ethical adoptions when you know people who are abolitionists don't believe that ethical and adoption you know it go together at all um, then it, it that would make a real difference as to what actually gets written in some places i think in a lot you could sort of just talk about adoptee rights and that's it um in terms of birth certificates and everything i'm really sorry i missed most of this because of my time converter but um i i think the thing is that some um people who are uh, fighting for adoptee rights also consider that you can leave a door open and uh have a, a last resort type of thing. Whereas a lot of others, and especially a lot of us in Australia, we don't consider that leaving a door open, even having adoption legislation is, is a safe thing to do. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, as you probably know, and many people know, we get that question or we get the question, well, you don't want, you, you want adoptions to disappear, don't you? And some people do. And some adoptees don't, or some adoptees don't even think about it. But what I'm seeing on Wikipedia, there is zero, if, if any, a mention of, um, and this is how I understand your abolitionist, that's referring to essentially abolishing adoption. I've seen no point of view on Wikipedia that um, relates to getting rid of adoption. And that's a valid point. I think it's a valid position that um, many adoptees have. 
some adoptees may not agree with it, but it is certainly something that should be on Wikipedia because this is an issue that um, adoptees and many others talk about. I also well, think I you're think seeing it. I also think you're seeing a movement away from adoption as well right now, and and so it could be a key topic to discuss. But there is no, I mean, the way Wikipedia obviously works, and we can't control generally what issues are discussed on a particular entry or page as long as those entries are cited to reliable sources and you know there's a neutrality in the um, creation of the entry and um, it's well sourced so it's a valid point if you can reliably provide the sources for it or you know cite to organizations that oppose the continuation of adoption it's something that should be in wikipedia because it's a it's an it's an option that people um very strongly believe in well i think coming from australia where we've only had about three four hundred in the last year mm -hmm. um when when i talk to people from america they can't conceive of not having many adoptions and they they don't realize that you know you can have a system that's a western system without it and uh even though we're being heavily influenced by the US at the moment to try and increase it, um, we know that that you can you can just have guardianship, um, and it's not as entrenched here. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think this. I think the the for Wikipedia purposes, the issue this topic may have is making sure you have the sources that you can cite to that um discuss abolishing adoption and so i think it's i think it's certainly fair game to have that and i'm not i'm certainly not opposed to it i mean there may be people who disagree within the adoptee community about it there may be political reasons people disagree with it doesn't mean it's not valid and it should be i think it should be included yeah so you're you're certainly welcome to be part of that yeah, so Sharon, you. that that's where you'd have your um, articles in Wikipedia that actually bring up um, the topic of guardianship. What is guardianship? Right. Kinship care, stewardship care. Like most Americans I've spoken to, really don't have any concept of these other models that Australia has actually been using for a long time. Um, so getting this into Wikipedia is ideal. It's perfect. Yeah, that's. I think it's a great example. Yeah. So just on birth certificates, um, if you just, if you're not changing birth certificates, you really don't have adoption. If you're not severing ancestry, you don't have adoption. So. Right. And so those would be the issues you'd have to work out. Yeah. On. And it may be that you form a team that discusses this and works your way through Wikipedia um, to find how, how best to add entries or change entries or, you know, include entries that discuss this issue. So, it, you know, I mean, I don't want people to be alone in the issues that they're working on because it could be very difficult issues for some people. It'd be good to have several people working on an issue together. And that'd be maybe a great example of one. Yeah. Uh, perhaps translation could be this a second part, a second phase of this project. Yep. Definitely. Um, Dale says it's fairly normal for citations to be made to sources that aren't in the same language as the article on Wikipedia. I've seen that's, that particular too. Common, that's particularly common on pages for write or wrote in other languages. Um, people are saying what topics they're interested in, which I put previously and I'll put it again now, the page or page to register to help us with this. And there is a section in that that asks interests as well. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah, you already have. I gave you the link. Yay, that's yeah, yeah, yeah I have everything. I put it in before, but there's been so many comments that it's so far up that I figured yeah. I would just put it in there again now. Yeah, that link is where you would say, yes, I'm interested. Uh, you would you know, tell us what you're specifically inter interested in and if there's something that's on that list that is not on that list that you want um, included, you would just click other and then type it in there. Yep. You know, this will continue. As you can see, we have a, a it's a long project. I mean, longish, I mean, because it's at least a, a year long before we really launch it for what it is. 
Um, and we'll have these, what I call mini sessions along the way. We'll have issues that we're going to have to work out and resolve along the way. We're going to have disputes that we're going to have that are, need to be resolved and have that scaffolding that Linnell talks about in place. And so um, expect additional events like this that gets into the more nitty gritty of it as opposed to an introduction and also expect um, us to not have a lot happening in the next uh, month or two but the time frame has things starting to really um, kick into gear beginning in january because there's a lot of a lot of organizing in the front end that we're gonna have to be doing I'm not saying we're ignoring people we want you a part of that but it's there's not there's not going to be much to see uh, until january right it's not a one two three thing right um greg eve says and we've we've had um i can't think of what i'm going to say cassandra on with us before mm -hmm. um so outside of this project have we as a community contemplated how the rights we have advocated for and continue to advocate for will be influencing the donor conceived and surrogacy conceived communities my answer is yes but i still have a lot to learn um and i think adoptees united has um started that discussion how we can be allies to the donor conceived community and it's it's an ongoing discussion yeah I, I i agree i think the issues are um very similar in some ways and very different in others but not at odds yeah and we had cassandra adams um did a presentation when was that that was back in i feel like the spring maybe i was gonna say the I feel like this yeah, yeah, beginning of the summer and of that's spring. And that's recorded. I'll shoot that when I follow up to this, I'll send you the YouTube video of that um, event, which I thought was great. She's great. Um, I think we'll wrap it up. And I just, I really want to thank everybody for being part of this. Um, I'm r really excited. Uh, I love the enthusiasm that I'm hearing. I love the uh, incredibly constructive criticism, which I, it's not, you know, it's not truly criticism, but it's, it's very constructive thoughts about how we can organize this and make sure that, um, it's diverse and inclusive and, um, has things in place that can deal with, um, inevitable disputes that we have as we go forward, but I'm excited for it. And I want to say thanks to everybody who participated and we'll keep working on this and um, hopefully have something to see and do starting in January, February.